introduction was so good, I feel like it's only downhill from there. Um, so I figure what I'll do is I'll uh, read you from the book for 15 or 20 minutes, and then afterwards I'll um, be happy to take questions and um, talk about uh, talk about either of the books and anything else that might be on your mind. Um, so yeah, so the basic dramatic premise of Enon is that um, the protagonist, Charlie Crosby, has lost his daughter, Kate, a 13-year-old uh, girl, uh, and the time frame of Enon is roughly from the time of her death to about the, the first anniversary of her death. And um, so I think I can just jump right in. One of the things that, um, I think all you need to know about what I'm, what I'm going to read is that um, um, after her death and Charlie finds, him, finds himself alone in his house and finds it intolerable to stay in the house. So he takes to spending his days and his nights um, wandering around the town, the meadows and the lanes and the forests and all this sort of stuff. And um, increasingly, as he's re on his way home, as he returns home just before dawn, he finds himself in the cemetery where Kate is buried, um, always behind her tombstone because he's ashamed of what has happened to him, uh, to the extent to which he has come unhinged since her, since her demise. Um, so I think the only other thing you need to know about this is, is that um, in a moment, not long after she dies, in a moment of um, anger, he punches a wall and uh, breaks a bunch of bones in his hand and um, is duly prescribed painkillers by his doctor, um, which he increasingly takes like candy and washes down with whiskey and he's sort of going, going down the chute. So. But I think that's all you need to know to set up the first part. I walked all afternoon through the woods and hidden meadows of Enon. The sun went down and dusk spread and darkness began to fall. At one point it occurred to me that I had not eaten anything, but I felt neither hungry nor very thirsty. I reached the western shore of Enon Lake as the last light left the sky. I knelt down by the water and raised my broken hand above my head so it wouldn't get wet and cupped some water in my good hand and took a couple sips. The water was cold and clean tasting, fine, mineral. I swallowed two pills with another mouthful of water, then jogged across the street and into the streets on the other side of the road at the edge of one of Enon's two nine-hole golf courses. The cemetery was a quarter mile back, uh, excuse me, the cemetery was a quarter mile away back toward the village. It lay between the two golf courses along the flank of a large hill. The golf courses and cemetery begin on flat tracks directly off the old post road to Boston which then steeply elevate in a succession of rises. I crossed the near golf course and stepped over the stone wall into the upper part of the cemetery. Kate was buried below, toward the front, in the family plot, next to my grandfather, George Washington Crosby, and my grandmother, Norma Crosby, and my mother, Betsy Crosby, and where I will be buried when I die. My great-grandmother, Kathleen Crosby, is also buried in the cemetery in another section. It was just superstition, but I did not want to pass in front of Kate's grave. Without having paid attention, I realized I had taken at least twice as many pills as I ought to have, and maybe more. It almost felt as if I were levitating when I stopped walking and stood still and looked down through the shadows to where Kate's stone was. The moon was out, and there was a beautiful view from the top of the cemetery. Deer browsed on the golf greens below to my right, and the tombstones made of white marble glowed. A corner of the lake was visible below, past the road, beyond the trees, sparkling. I sat and surveyed the land and looked down the hill toward the Norway maple under which my grandparents and my mother and my daughter lay. A stupor fell over me and I floated without direction for some time, possibly hours, until I was roused by the voices of two young girls. They were sitting 15 yards away from me, to my left, cross-legged, face to face, hidden from the road behind an enormous rectangular white headstone, on the other side of which, as I knew from my many trips to read the inscriptions on both the cemetery's prominent memorials and its modest ones, lay a family of six named Smith, all of whom had died during an epidemic in 1839. The girls shared a cigarette and swapped a bottle of wine. They both bent forward to examine something on the ground between them. One took a drag from the cigarette and passed it back to the other and opened a small book she had in her lap. The girl with the book held it close to her face and fingered through the pages until she said, here it is. 
What? What is it? The other girl said. Give me a second. The girl examined the book, then dropped it in her, into her lap and stared at her friend. She said, dude, this deck is whack. This deck is whack. It's always so right. This card is that you lust for someone you know is evil. The other girl blew smoke out of her nose and clapped herself on the head, her forearm full of bracelets and trinkets, clinking and twinkling in the moonlight, and groaned, oh man, that's Carl. Both girls had long, very dark, unkempt hair, which I assumed was dyed black, but could not tell for sure. They both had pale skin and heavy black eyeliner on, and very dark lipstick, which might have been black or a very dark shade of purple or red, and they both wore all black clothes. I guessed they were a couple of years older than Kate. I liked them immediately and imagined Kate being their friend and going through a safe and uproarious adolescence with them. I even found myself wishing that they might do what they did in front of Kate Stone so that Kate could hear them and have the company, although she was too close to the road and the girls would have been overheard by someone walking his dog who would have probably called the police on his cell phone. I lay still where I was for half an hour while the girls sipped wine and smoked and used their tarot cards as prompts to talk about what was important to them. Their conversation was endearing, although I was embarrassed by a good deal of it and embarrassed that I was eavesdropping on them. But I did not want to try to sneak away or attempt to rise and act as if I'd stumbled on them by accident. I did not want to frighten or upset them. So I let them chatter and laugh and enjoyed the smell of the smoke from their cigarettes and looked up at the stars and tried to see if I could detect their movement through the sky and thought about Kate watching the whole scene and being amused by it and teasing me about it when we both returned home. Toward midnight, one of the girls said, man, it's almost 12, I gotta go, my parents will be home soon and get all over me if I come in later than them. The other girl said, yeah, me too. Both girls stood up and stretched and brushed off the backs of their skirts, their bracelets jingling. I heard the cork squeaking back into the mouth of the wine bottle. The girls walked back down the hill, past my family, still talking but more quietly. They passed under the light of a street lamp and into shadow and were gone. If you look at the side of the hill between the sixth and seventh holes of the Enon Golf Club, west of the cemetery, you can still see traces of the foundation of the town's only windmill. The windmill burned down in 1661. Farther down the hill by the road near the putting green for the tenth hole stood the house of the father of Seraph Good, who was condemned as a witch and hanged down the road in Salem in 1692 and who famously told her accuser that God would give him blood to drink. I wondered if the girls I had seen in the cemetery knew this. I imagined it would please them, that they'd feel an immediate kinship with her, like Kate always had from the first time I told her about the witch trials, perhaps one that ran deeper than their teenage sense of persecution. I read about Sarah Good in an old history of the town, published in 1823 for the town's bicentennial. It was striking that at the time, the author of the book, a man named Barnett Wood, already considered Sarah Good a part of the town's remote history. I like to think about the fact that he wrote his book 175 years before I read it, and that Sarah Good met her fate 131 years before he wrote it. Sarah was hanged in Salem, but there were nights when I passed through the center of the village and imagined her swinging in the wind from a gallows where the Civil War Memorial is, which was originally a green used for common pasturage. The statue standing atop the pediment of the memorial is modeled after a man named Benjamin Conant, who fought in the Union Army and was famous for the grapevines he kept, and who repaired shoes before and after the war out of a small shack behind one of the larger houses along Main Street. Benjamin Conant's statue was erected in 1870 while he was still alive. 47 years after Barnett Wood published his book, A History of Enon, on the occasion of its bicentennial. 178 years after Sarah Good was hanged in Salem, 30 years after the first Crosby settled in Enon, and 135 years before my daughter was buried half a mile up the street. In fact, Barnett Wood and Benjamin Conant are both buried in the cemetery as well. I don't know where Sarah Good was buried, maybe in Salem. I never looked it up. But the woods of Enon are full of very old, unmarked graves, and hers may well be among them, along with the bones of animals and citizens, 
Fathers and brothers, oxen and horses, mothers and aunts, chickens, pigs, sons and daughters, anonymous cats and owls, Puritans and Indians, and unnamed infants, getting their bones mixed in the currents of soil and groundwater, migrating beneath the foundations of our houses and the fairways of the golf courses, trading ribs and teeth and shins and knuckles, commuting under baseball diamonds in the beds of streams, snagging up on roots and rocks, shells of granite and seams of clay. There are certainly more citizens of Enon beneath its 5,400 acres than there are above it. Just beneath our feet on the other side of the surface of the earth, there is another subterranean Enon which conceals its secret business by conducting it too slowly for its purposes to be observed by the living. So one of the things that Charlie does um, is he takes the memory of his daughter, and one of the ways he tries to negotiate his grief and her loss and her memory is he takes all of those different layers of the town's history and he places her into little narratives that he makes about the people who lived in the town with Sarah Good and all of those things. And it's a way of sort of mediating the immediacy of the tragedy. I, I think of it almost in a way of, uh, almost similar to um, Perseus and Medusa. You know, if you look at the Medusa straight in the face, straight in the eye, you'll turn to stone, you'll perish. But if you look at her through a mirror, you can negotiate her terribleness. Um, so he invents all sorts of different versions of his daughter, and this is just um, this is just one of the versions. It happens later in the book as um, as uh, things keep keep getting darker. <laughs> so, it's not beach reading. I'm sorry. Mm. My next book will be a musical comedy. I be um, okay, so. The obsidian girl moves through the trees at night. She moves across the fairway of the golf course near the road by the stone wall that acts as the hood for the footlights to a kind of stage. She is all but invisible, the girl of black glass, appearing only as a wobbly blur. She is a dark lens. Through her, the dark underpinnings of the world are visible, but they turn whoever might see them to stone, or to ice, or to salt, or to marsh grass. Every night, just before dawn, she climbs down into the hill through a hidden trap door. She sounds like a crystal decanter rolling along the granite seams that lead down to the heart of the hill, where a furnace burns all day and all night, and dark, vague men shovel coal into its white-hot mouth. When the girl made of black glass appears, the men lean their shovels against the walls of the chamber and retreat into the shadows. The girl steps in front of the furnace, and the heat roars out and over her like a shimmering hurricane. She tilts her head back and holds her hands out at her sides. The heat blasts at her, and the tips of her fingers begin to glow. The outlines of her face and arms and legs begin to buckle and kink. Her legs give it the knees, and the rest of her slides off them and drops in front of them. She remains upright for a moment, but then she topples, face first onto the dirt floor in front of the open furnace. It appears as if she is sinking into the dirt at first, but she's actually melting. The glass girl is melting. The glass held the shape of a girl only while it was cool but now it is molten and pools over the floor. There is no way to tell if the glass leaks out of the girl or if the girl leaks out of the glass. There is a sound, no, that, pardon me, there is a sound that no human ear can hear, coming from a place no human eye can see, from deeper within the hill, but also from deep in the sky and the water and inside the trees and inside the rocks. The sound is a voice coming from deep inside the throat of the world. The sound is a note from a register so low, no human ear can hear it, but many people throughout the town are disturbed from their sleep by it. It is a note from a song, the shape of which is too vast to ever know. The note is a part of great vaulted cathedrals of chords that keep the universe speeding out from its own genesis. It is sensate. And down in the chamber of the hill, it sounds both like weeping and like laughter. And both are at the grief of the glass girl, 
who throws herself in front of the fires every morning just before dawn, and who, to her unending despair, is remade every evening in a deeper foundry and evicted from the depths of the hill back to the surface, where the cool air flowing through the grass cools and sets her glass eyes and her glass brow, her glass brains and her glass heart, and she begins another night as the brittle memories of a man who is the father of a girl she never was. So I'll just read one more little bit. This is a whole chapter, but it's only a page and a half. And it sort of happens right in the middle of the novel. And it's sort of just a, it's, it's kind of like a little portrait of, of Charlie and his, and his predicament. So. There's a little bit of gratuitous drug use in this, so pardon me. Um, Late one winter night after the new year, which came and went without my being aware of it for two weeks, after I'd lost track of how much whiskey I had drunk and how many pills I had crushed and snorted, I lapsed into a blackout and awoke nearly frozen in the cemetery six hours later. I was laid out on my side, stopped up against the backs of three closely laid headstones for three sisters who had all died on December 12, 1839 at eight, seven, and five years old. I was sure that my toes and fingers had frostbite. By the wind and the barest light in the east, I could tell that it must be after five in the morning. The sky was still full of stars, but they were not the limpid, tame stars of an early summer evening. They were cold, wild, staring, and ferocious. They were stars that had arrived in Enon's sky from the deepest trenches of space, from terrible, unimaginable beginnings. Their light democratized by the present moment, but in fact a vast, tangled thicket of times, of ghosted universes haunting the hillside with their artifacted light. Their light unsettled me the way the open eyes of a dead person would, because it is impossible to believe that open eyes do not see. Their light blazed in the eyes of Enon's dead for a moment in false resurrection. I rose and convulsed from the cold and retched from the poison. I looked over at the snow-covered golf course where kids sledded every winter and imagined the dead having sledding parties at midnight on the back slope of the hill, warming their finger bones in blue fires that they kindled in granite urns, laughing when they held their hands inside the flames. I imagined them melting clumps of dirty ice in a tin bucket over the fire and drinking the hot, muddy brew and cackling with glee as it ran off the backs of their jawbones and spattered down their ribs. I imagined them using headstones for sleds. The idea made me sick and I repented of it. I had the urge to go to Kate's stone and kneel in front of it and say I'm sorry over and over again because no matter how much I knew better, I could not stop myself from stepping over the same dark threshold, night after night, trying to follow her into the country of the dead in order to fetch her back, even though she visited me in dreams and never left my waking thoughts. Memories of her feeding the birds and practicing running and playing cribbage were not enough. I was ravenous for my child and took to gorging myself in the boneyard, hoping that she might possibly meet me halfway or just beyond, one night, if only for an instant step back into her own bare feet under the wet grass or fallen leaves or snowy ground of the living Enon so that we could share just one last human word. So, I think that's a fair sample. Uh, thank you, thank you. So I'm happy to take questions, constructive criticism. <laughs> yeah. You seem to be attracted to fairly tragic tales. Yeah, I'm attracted to tragic tales. Yes. What What is it that attracts you to these stories? Well, there's a number of things. I mean, I'm not a particularly morbid guy. I'm you don't appear to be, no. Well adjusted. Um, but I, I just sort of think, you know, when I think of the books that I love to read, they're often tragic, you know, Madame Flaubert and Sophie's Choice and Hamlet. And, you know, a lot of the great works of art are, I mean, I think one of the hallmarks of, of a lot of great works of art is that they, that art is a perfect place for the imagination to grapple with the most difficult subjects in human experience, you know? And so when I'm trying to write a, when, when I decide to write a book or when an idea comes to me, it's usually, it usually comes out of, you know, the sorts of things that, that preoccupy me when I'm 
insomniac at four in the morning and I'm worried about the world, you know? And in, my, in, in, the, in the case of Enon, part of that, part of the sort of motivation to write the book is that I have uh, too many very dear friends who have lost children, oh. you know? I mean, too many, you know, once. But, but and um, I'm a parent. And when I be the first time I became a parent was the first time in my life I realized something could really happen that would actually just make me go out into the backyard and feel, feel like I couldn't do anything but go out into the backyard and dig a hole and climb in it and cover myself over. Um, and so many of these people who I know have lost children have are just wonderful people and they've managed to, you know, and so I just, I, I just thought I could never do that. So that was part, part of what I wanted to explore in that, that, that kind of irreducible kind of human tragedy, you know? But but that said, the book is absolutely a book about love. It's about a parent's, you know, it's, it's, it's Charlie loses his daughter, but he's still a parent, he's still her father. And it's his struggle. A lot of the book has to do with his, the, he has a conscience, and mm -hmm. a lot of the book has to do with his struggle of, I'm doing all these terrible things. I'm sort of going down the drain. I'm, you know, abusing alcohol and abusing drugs. And when I run out of the drugs I'm abusing, I start breaking into my neighbors' houses and stealing theirs. And I know I shouldn't be doing this, and it's humiliating, and it's no way to bear, you know, to 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 be the steward of the memory of my daughter. And yet here I am doing it, you know. And that's a very that's another kind of universal human predicament, you know, from the most trivial examples day to day to the most morally profound. Like I shouldn't smoke a cigarette, I shouldn't eat the whole chocolate cake, I shouldn't, you know, betray my brother, I shouldn't leave my fellow man, you know, in the gutter, oh, that that sort of thing. So those are the kind of things that are sort of just irreducible and I just, you know, felt like they were there was certainly enough substance to them to, to, to grapple with in the novel. Yeah. But, yeah I, That's a kind of maybe similar question about that. I was wondering while you were writing this did you kind of, were you carrying that, like you had to kind of be in a state of grief in some ways to, to be writing, mm -hmm. were you kind of carrying that day to day to be able to kind of pull yourself out of it and then that you're writing? Yeah, I mean I think so, as a writer you sort of have to be able to do that, but you know, I, but there's a kind of, when you're, when I'm in the middle of writing a book there's just kind of an intensity that you live with anyways, and, and, and even though it's a, it's a first person narrative, so in a way, you know, to paraphrase Flaubert, Char Charlie's saying moi, you know, so I really did have to kind of climb into his nerves, and, as it were, and experience it. Um, at the same time, there's all sorts of technical things that you're sort of thinking about as well, and, you know, and, and making sure that you're listening to his voice and, and, and getting, every, you know, getting his, I think of the book as a kind of confession or a prayer, or a hymn. So I want to make sure that every, you know, everything, I, I'm listening closely so I accurately render everything that he says. So I'm feeling that, you know, I have to have total empathy with him, but at the same time, I'm also, it's sort of, you know, I have this, you know, this task or this job of um, making sure that, you know, I do him justice. Yeah. yeah. But it's intense. But it was. It's a, what it is is it's a very intimate experience too. With this, let's say with Tinker's, I think of Tinker's kind of more as like a chamber piece. It's almost like a little string quartet, and there are different voices, and they're sort of they're contrapuntal, and they have different key, you know. Whereas, kind of one of the technical challenges and emotional challenges, but fulfilling challenges of this book was that from the very beginning, it was one voice, it was one voice, very intimate, very close, and confessing. His soul, so you know, and so it was. It, so it was going to be that kind of. It was like a prayer. It was like listening to somebody, say, you know, like Saint Augustine, you know. So there's something sort of. Very, it's like it's like a book of lamentation or something like that too. So there's a kind of very close intimacy to it that that made for a special kind of intensity to it. And part of that, what's interesting about that is when you're when you're writing, you realize, oh, as a writer, that's very difficult because I can't get into the third person. It's difficult to get space to see Charlie in the in the wider world. It can, you can end up very foreshortened. And so what I realized is that would be something he'd be concerned with too. Part of the reason he starts to abuse drugs and alcohol and tells these stories is trying to get an arm's length between him and just the under, you know, just trying to get, a, get somehow come up with a little bit of perspective so he can just sort of see things and kind of triangulate things emotionally and psychologically. 
So, for example, one of the things I did is I had him imagine himself in third person. There's a, there's a scene where, since I won't go into detail, but there's a scene where he, he suddenly sees himself and his wife, and they, they're sort of breaking up, their marriage is sort of falling apart very quickly and very early in the book. Um, he suddenly sees them as, as if they're two actors on a stage and sort of describes their whole house as if it's in third person and he's watching them move through a, a set on a stage. So that gave me a little bit of a wide shot, but it also gave him a wide shot. You know, so it wasn't just me doing it for my convenience, it was also, it was, it was consistent with the character's inner life. Being a, a young writer, how did you thank you. Yeah, how did, how did your life change after you were awarded the uh, time? It, it changed radically. Yeah, I mean, it just it just was, you know, and and, and particularly, I mean, some of the kind of uh, the oddity of it is winning it for a first book because with most Pulitzer Prizes, you say, oh, that guy or that woman, she finds she won, you know. But everybody's like, Paul, who, mm. what, you know. Um, and then there's all the stuff about like, how are you going to follow up your Pulitzer Prize winning first novel? You know, there's all this kind of worldly stuff that you just can't let paralyze you. You know, I just figured I'd be writing a second novel anyways, regardless of what Tinker's did. And I already had the book contract actually for Tinker, for Enon before Tinker's won. So what I was able to do is just, you, you just can't mix up writing with publishing. You can't mix up like the create, you know, making the work of art, you know, or whatever you want to, whatever terms you want to use for it, and like the just the world of publishing and the outside world of book reviewing and all that sort of stuff. So I was just able to, I, I was already habituated to being able to, like, when I flip up the laptop, just everything in the outside world goes away, and I can go right down into, right down into the w world of, you know, the work itself. And then when I come back up and I'm you know, awake at night worrying about all my friends, then I worry about, oh my God, how am I going to fall up the points of crime? You know, but that's, that's <laughs> private. <laughs> that's not like a private citizen, you know? <laughs> so, and it's all kind of fun. And I was a bookseller for years. And so you sort of know, like, it's the, it's the big rowdy world of book publishing and book reviewing. And, you know, I, you know the second, because especially in prize winning, too, you know, just every year I remember, you know, sitting around with all the other booksellers and sort of, okay, this person won the Pulitzer and half of the booksellers would say, it's the end of Western civilization because that jerk won the Pulitzer. And the other one, people would say, art goes on for at least another year. You know, whatever, you know, just that kind of like people are very partisan. And so it was just, I was so familiar with it that it was just like I could keep sort of my, dis you know, it was just sort of interesting to suddenly become the protagonist of that that year's version of that sort of thing. So, yeah, and so, I mean, so far, I have to tell you, there's no downside to winning a Pulitzer. <laughs> 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 it's all right, you know. Yeah? This is a terrible question, but what is your curriculum vitae, as they say, your background? My background, um, I, you know, I, I was a terrible student. It took me <laughs> six years to get out of UMass Amherst with a, you know, a two-point, you know, whatever. <laughs> Grade point average, and I spent most of my twenties playing in bands. I was a drummer, mm. drummer in, a, in in different bands, and um, I ended up coming to writing because the band was on what we thought was a hiatus that proved permanent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I'd always wanted to try to write write a story. I think like most people who end up being writers, you start your write you start your life off as a reader, and your reading just sort of hits a kind of critical mass or a kind of momentum where you, it, reading the books isn't enough. You want to start actually answering your favorite books back in a way. That's kind of almost like my informal kind of operating definition of literary fiction. It's fiction that's largely motivated by other books, you know, and it's in dialogue with other books. So I just, we, I had some time off and I, um, so I wrote an, a, a just a, a, an incredibly terrible story um, and took a uh, two-week summer class at um, Skidmore College, which is in Saratoga Springs, New York. And um, just by the luck of the draw, the first teacher I ever had was a novelist named Marilyn Robinson. Oh, and yes. so, you know, within ten minutes of her walking into the room, I just thought, that's the life of the mind I want, I want for myself, you know. And I, thought, I, I find out she taught at the Iowa Writers Workshop, so I said, state school, I can get into a state school. <laughs> You know, so I eventually was able to study with her, and then since you know that I taught in various places and stuff like that, so pretty pretty straightforward. 
I think your family rooted in New England. Yeah, my family's rooted. So Enon is actually the original colonial name for the little uh, Massachusetts town that I grew up in on the North Shore of Boston. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was another thing that I, I, I um, wanted to stay as local as I could, as it were, with the landscape and the history and the seasons and the geography and the, ta the, the people, the citizens of the town and everything because um, when, I, well, when I first got the idea for Enon, it came to me like as a visual image. I just, I just had this image of, it was almost like a, um, like a paper cutout, like a silhouette that somebody had done, almost like a, like a Halloween silhouette. It was of a very exaggerated hillside that was studded with um, headstones. And there was a guy creeping across the crown of the hill under the stars and the moon. And I knew all at once that it was the Enon Cemetery, that the guy creeping across the top of the hill was Charlie Crosby, that he was creeping home after a night of misadventure, and that his daughter Kate was buried down below, and he was sneaking behind her grave because he was ashamed of who he had become. You know? So when I first got that, and the way, and kind of like the visual way that it presented itself to me, I was like, cool, it's like a, a Hawthorne spooky ghost story. It'll be, and, and then I wrote the fair, first paragraph of the book, and I realized, oh, this is like incredible tragedy. And I think like most writers, you know, when you first discover the real complexity and the real challenges of the subject you've decided, you, that it's presented itself to you, your first impulse is just to run. You think, oh, I don't want to write a whole book about a parent who loses a child. Like, that's just incredible. Tra but, um, but then that's usually the minute where you realize you have a viable project. You know, for, for some reason, I did, like, my experience is always, like, I feel there's a strange kind of greater sense of comfort in feeling like the, the, that I want, the book I want to write is too tough, for, it's too difficult for me to write. And the only way for me to become a good enough writer to write it is to write it. You know, it doesn't work theoretically. You can't think it up and then do it, you have to actually, you know, do the work of So then when I realized, you know, the, the, the tragic, the, 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 the starkness of that kind of tragic, the tragedy of that premise, I wanted everything local so that I wouldn't, so that with every sentence I could be listening to Charlie and what he was actually saying to me, and I could, I could register his experience moment by moment as precisely and as true with as great a truth as possible. Um, so I needed all of that landscape and everything that was local to me, kind of right at my fingertips. So I wouldn't, you know, at some you know, crucial moment have to stop and like look up like, is chicory blooming in Nevada in <laughs> June? You know, it was just sort of like, no, I know where it is because all that landscape, I mean, I've spent time in that cemetery. I've spent time in those woods. I just know the seasons so well that I don't need, I don't need muscle memory. It's just, it's, it's in my brain and my body kind of on a cellular level. So I could just completely concentrate on, on him. So. And, then, and then what happens is you, you, find, you, know, you think, you know, every, every story you choose to write, um, you're actually just writing in a long tradition. Every story comes out of a long tradition. So with this, I quickly found myself, and therefore, again, I gave it to Charlie, you know, in the, in the realm of old, very old myth, you know, this is Orpheus going back down to the underworld. It's Persephone and Demeter. It's the grieving parent or the grieving lover um, not being able to uh, not being able to accept the death of a loved one and, and, and going down into the underworld and trying to bring them back up. Um, so I just get, again I gave Charlie all of those those impulses and let him use them as ways that he sort of negotiates again negotiates you know with the loss of his daughter. Other questions? Uh oh, you're a plant, so she, you're going to heckle me. Oh, no, no, no. I was just thinking, can you name a book that would be the opposite of you know? Um, that's already been written. The opposite of Enon, like the the uh, um, anti Enon. No, I can't. <laughs> Somebody glad about the birth of their child, something like that. I don't quite know what the opposite. Would. It's funny because I, I just I just think of. Um, you know, again, just, just I, I think of Anna Karenin, I think of Madame Bovary, I think of you know uh, William, F like the Sound of the Fury, Quentin Thompson committing suicide at the end, all that sort of stuff. It's so you know, literature is a good place for kind of again dealing with those kind of heavy subjects. So, and it's kind of tough if everybody's doing all right and happy. It's not a very interesting book <laughs> in some ways, you know. I mean, because the thing about Enon, though, is for all of, I mean. Something that was, that was that I kind of had had faith in was that 
as deep and as dark into the underworld as Charlie went. Um, I knew that it was still going to be ultimately a hopeful book, even if the hope was costly and modest. Um, that it was basically still going to be affirmative. Um, it was not going to just end in utter darkness. And so what my hope was is that as deep as the darkness was, and as dark as the darkness got, that, that by virtue of counterpoint then, when the small amount of light went on, it would be all the more poignant and beautiful and lucid and precious for its rarity, you know? And so it would just, it would have a, it would be, it would be a, um, it would just shine all the more brightly, as it were, you know? Um, and so, I, yeah, I just, it's a hopeful book, <laughs> in the contrary of like what I read. But, yeah. Yeah? I read about your process of writing with teenagers. Um, I was wondering how it differed from this, given how much more linear it is, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tinker's is very, very unlinear because it has to do with the consciousness of a guy whose who's, um, consciousness is starting to dissipate. And most of the book is him actually trying to take the sort of stream of memories that presents itself to him and sort of snatch fragments and make a coherent portrait of his father out of it as kind of a gesture of reconciliation with his father. Uh, and Enon, yeah, Enon just has a much more... Um, straightforward kind of chronology to it because it's just 12 months you go through four seasons and again it's that one voice so it doesn't keep changing perspectives um, but I still wrote the book the same way which is just slapdash and haphazard and all over the place because it just doesn't come to me in a linear way partially because even though I kind of had a more straightforward chronology to hang all the stuff off of with Enon I still write it from character outwards and so when you're writing from character, you're writing about consciousness, and consciousness is not linear. I mean, we make it conform to line, you know, linear kind of schedule, so you get up in the morning, you have your coffee, you go to work, you do. but like when you're sort of left and kind of riding the updrafts, your consciousness can move e everywhere instantaneously. So I think of it as being almost like quantum, you know? Whereas something like plot, and li linear plot is kind of more Newtonian, it's just like it's the gears and the wheels and every effect B has to have a traceable cause A and all that. Um, but it, so again, in the, in the writing of it, it was very, it's just associative, you know. It's also a way to keep myself interested. If I get to a point where, you know, I wake up in the morning and I've been writing about, you know, scene, a certain scene or a certain character or something for the whole week, and I just sort of think, oh, I'm kind of tired of writing about that character right now. I'm just going to kind of go over there and to the other part of the novel and write about that for a while. And then at the end, I, I arrange it all. Yeah. Did you have to do... Yeah, there's some chronology stuff, but that's all. That's all just sort of like housekeeping stuff, you know, just keeping that, keeping that in order. Um, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Because in Tinker's, I, I actually Tinker's was such a, 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 a kind of a chaotic manuscript when I first finished it that um, what I actually did is I, I printed up the whole manuscript and I took. If you look at it, it's mostly fairly short passages, and most passages are not longer than three or four pages, and some of them are just very brief paragraphs. I cut the entire manuscript up into all those little passages, and then I laid them all out on my living room floor, and I spent a weekend moving them all around and getting them to work in the way that the, that the, book, that the book actually ended up being, the, the form of the book actually ended up being published in. Um, and that was actually, it was interesting, because there was this, I don't have many epiphanies. Ah, so, you know, when I get one, it's, it's you know, I sort of, you know, clutch at it. And, and in that case, what I realized is that there was some, there was, Tinker's had some kind of integrity, because me kind of scavenging around amongst all these little fragmentary pieces, trying to pull a cohesive book together, was literally a reenactment of what the protagonist of the book spends the whole book doing him trying to get those memories of his father and put them together into something that, you know, so it's almost like the, the you know, the essential act of the book was came out of the book and was reproducing itself in my, in, you know, it was almost like a performance piece or something. So I was like, that's, a, that's probably a pretty good sign when everything is sort of keeps feeding back into the book. In fact, I was so struck by that that I went back and gave the character a, a scene where he explicitly thinks of himself moving the memories of his father around and his life and his childhood around as if he's um, arranging the tiles in a mosaic and coming up with a mosaic, you know? So you just keep, you give all that stuff right back to the book, right back to the characters. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, thank
thank you all for coming out. I was great. I really appreciate it.